Welcome to ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News. The program you're about to see is free to watch, courtesy of YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. But it wasn't free to make. ARVN's got a lot of money invested in video equipment like this sweet camera and that editing system back there. And it takes a lot of time to shoot and edit a program like this. So I'm asking you to make a voluntary payment, contribution, whatever you want to call it. Just stop by our website, arvn.tv, and you'll see a link to make that payment, whatever you think the program is worth to you. I guess you could say that this program is brought to you by you. So thanks for watching and enjoy the show. My name is George uh, N2APB, and I'll be uh, speaking today about digital modes. This is an introduction to, di to digital modes. And as an introduction um, seminar, and this is an hour and a half long, I don't know if it'll go as long as an hour and a half, we'll, we'll see. Uh, please, let's make this an interactive type of thing. Um, I suspect and I, and I target that you are here because you want to learn more about digital modes. Maybe you've not done it, uh, digital modes. Uh, maybe you have uh, tried it and had some difficulty and you'd like to get some tips and techniques. You, may, you probably have heard about PSK31, but what about Hellschreiber? What about Thor? What about Amtor, Pac, uh, um, Pactor? Uh, there's a lot there, and, and what I'll do and what I'll target this toward is kind of a broad range of the technology, uh, give you a bit of a sense for what's out there. We'll listen to some sound samples here, and at the end of the presentation, I'll be able to use some of the software on here. I've got some pre-recorded uh, digital mode communications that I can pump in there, and we can actually see how some of the software works, specifically FL Digi and DigiPan, which happen to be my two favorite uh, uh, programs. And you'll get a bit of a feel, maybe, how you can do this at home fairly easily. Um, I've always, I, I mentioned this yesterday in the talks, I've always been a, um, a CW guy, uh, true and true. I, it kind of goes with the QRP nature in the building. It's easy to build a CW rig, and, and uh, it's just more gratifying to me to build something and put it on the air. So I've, most of my life I've been uh, a CW guy, hardly know what a microphone is, and hence hardly know what a, an SSB rig is, okay? You use it with a microphone, I think. So, um, but when it comes to digital mode, I said, wow, this is a really cool, way. and I love boat anchors too. I'm really, really into boat anchors. So here we've got uh, a guy who, um, uh, built a you know this little mo digital modem and DSP technology and advanced you know kind of leading edge stuff in one world but still boat anchors in the other I'm looking to see how that can converge and uh, digital mode is is perhaps one way that it can because digital mode is uh, technology that uses SSB but not necessarily a, a microphone so that made me kind of happy and um, it can be used with an SSB radio. It doesn't have to be a, uh, a new fancy fangled, uh, um, you know, 15 mode handheld submersible thing. Uh, although that is a nice rig that they have as a grand prize today uh, for tonight's uh, uh, banquet. But it can be used um, on any kind of uh, um, an SSB rig. A little bit of stability is necessary, as we'll we'll see. But it it opened up in in the last oh I don't know maybe seven, eight years, it really opened up my particular hobby. You know, like, um, I was enjoying myself, but now there's like an entire new aspect of the hobby, and that's a bit of the excitement that I wanted to convey with you here today. So, if, it's, if this is too basic, um, the, the, the presentation next door about how to use, which, which, which mode to use in emergency communications, that might be okay, uh, but we're gonna go through some, some basics here. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, again, what, just what is digital communications? Again, you might have heard a lot about it, but not really understood you know, uh, you know, what it is. At its heart, it's modulation and demodulation. And then a happy ending with a contact or two. Um, we're going to survey some digital modes. There's a boatload of information on the website, on the internet, of course. And, uh, I'm hoping that maybe you'll go on and, and look at some of the links and I've got at the end of the slide deck 
you'll be able to see um, a lot of examples and a lot of people's successes that they've done in building the interfaces in contact, making different contacts, because each mode tends to be have its own kind of specialty and characteristics. Some are good for super low power communications and reliable uh, uh, in, in noise. Some are have error recovery and hence, uh, or error correction, and hence have absolutely perfect um, uh, transmission and reception. Um, others are designed for uh, communications, just, just typing, as you would like on, on the internet, uh, uh, in a chat or on your, on your phone. Um, conversational mode is what they, what they call it. Others are picture-oriented. They, they just transmit, transmit and then receive um, bitmaps, essentially, that are representative of the information being transferred. Uh, Hellschreiber is, is a good example of that, and, and we'll see some of these things. Um, and, and if you, the, re, the reason you're sitting here maybe is because when you're tuning across the band at any given time, and you hear a lot of stuff on there, a lot of, especially if you go a little bit off the beaten path, you hear a lot of different kind of tones and beeps and warbles, and and you know you know you, you probably have a feeling that it's digital mode, but you don't really know, and oh man. And after a while, believe it or not, you start to uh, identify what it is, and then you can do what it takes in order to receive it. And you'd be surprised sometimes. And then the thing that's always been a bugaboo with me and with everybody that, that I deal with, uh, again, Joe uh, and I deal with the uh, N2CX, and I deal a lot with the New Jersey Club and beginners and, and uh, Boy Scouts and, and kids in the church group and so on. And they like to get into these things, and we enjoy kind of instructing them and, uh, and how to build and how to make uh, small circuits. When it comes time to interfacing to the PC, it's a bear. I mean, what could be simpler? Plug in a cable in or two cables into your PC, and, and you're off and running. Well, it's really not all that straightforward. Uh, there's some hidden, hidden sand traps and tar pits and you name it. Um, I saw some chuckles in the audience here, so you might know what I'm talking about. Things like interrupts and, and the proper version of drivers and interoperability of the components and which application works on your laptop, which you got to put on the workstation. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what my secret sauce is. I'm going to show you what I would recommend to, uh, to, to a Boy Scout, Girl Scout sitting in the audience here looking to try digital mode for the first time. Uh, and it's worked for me, it's worked for our club members, and uh, maybe you'll be able to take some tips uh, uh, from this. All right, any, any questions before we get started as far as like, uh, you know, what my agenda is and the approach, and is there anything that you'd like me to concentrate on? Is there some particular thing? Uh, somebody that, that was sitting back over there where Scotty was uh, said, am I going to talk about MDR? Uh, was that you? Somebody asked a question. If you've got a favorite mode or a mode that you've heard about or your friend told you about that you'd like to hear a little bit more about, we'll talk about it. Chances are I can pretty quickly dig up a sample of that. And with the, with the software that I'll be showing, I can interact with that and we can actually see some of that, uh, that communication right here on the screen. So you get a chance to see that, that modulation scheme and then how the software and the interconnections that we were talking about uh, make that come about. Yeah. I'd love to hear you talk on JT65 if you would. On JT65, I'm going to touch on that. Good point. Uh, JT65, just as a precursor, is uh, uh, a new mode, uh, the, one of the newer modes, that is that developed in, in recent uh, years, uh, spearheaded by Joe Taylor. Uh, and uh, you all probably have heard of uh, uh, Whisper, WSPR. OK, that's kind of taken the ham community by storm, and you got beacons all over the place. A little bit of a, um, it's anathema to me a little bit, having a unattended beacons all over the place, but the comeback is that it's low power, and nobody hears it anyway, so. <laughs> OK. That, that one is very popular in the 500 kilohertz experimenters band. Ah, OK. Wow. The, 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 the comment from the audience was that uh, that whisper was very popular in the 500 kilohertz band. Um, and I'll repeat this from time to time so the uh, tape can hear 
uh, the, the comments. Um, yeah, no, no doubt, and it's good for propagation, forecasting, and, and so on. But coming back to the, coming back to the point, J, what, what excites me is the actual communication that would come about from that. So um, Whisper is a method for beaconing um, and remote reception on a, on a waterfall, uh, PC waterfall display. I'll define some of these terms if, they're, if it's unfamiliar to you. Um, it, it's one-way type of communications. But the techniques with the protocol are used to form a two-way conversation, but it's still really, really slow communication, <laughs> if you know what I mean. With slow speed, it's, it's a communications thing and a mathematics kind of thing, but with slow speed comes much lower bandwidth. With lower bandwidth comes the ability to have whatever transmitted power that you're, tr that you're transmitting in, up your, into your antenna concentrated into that lower bandwidth. And on the other side, on the reception side, it makes it much easier um, for the received, receiving station to receive that signal. It's, you know, it's sort of like there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Tansenafel? Tansenafel. Tans, okay. It takes a professor to know that, right? It's such a thing as a free lunch. Yep. So you, you pay for it one way or the other, um, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a, I, I'm, I'm enjoying that aspect. We'll touch on JT65. Okay, so here is digital communication. This, uh, this is like a, a layperson, so not quite a layperson, certainly not a high-end technical uh, definition, description of, of modulation techniques and so on, and I didn't even bother putting up whether it's uh, A1 type uh, modulation or A3J and, and that. Uh, for the purposes of, of this right now, we've got a standard, we've got a standard, um, call it a um, architecture. This is what we see normally in, in a, uh, um, this can be considered a very simple direct conversion transmitter and then turn it around, it's, it's kind of a receiver. You've got a local oscillator here. This is the thing that you're turning on the front dial. That's your local oscillator, LO. And it produces a carrier frequency, FC. This is about as technical as we're going to get, so kind of bear with me. And over here, we've got the signal called FA. I have no idea what A stands for. Audio. Good point. And because, and, and hence, this really is baseband uh, direct conversion. So here we've got uh, an audio oscillator of some sort. So I sort of bastardized the, the, the architecture a little bit and saying for voice, what you've got here is modulated voice, a microphone that's coming in here, and the audio frequency is coming into this mixer. And you know that when you mix a carrier with an audio frequency, you're going to get the sum and the difference coming out of the mixer, the sum and difference frequencies. You filter off one side or the other, and for example, um, and, and then you end up with SSB single sideband. Here's the carrier frequency, and generally we would get a mix of the audio with the upper sideband, and what's not shown here would be a corresponding um, uh, frequency that would be on the lower side of that carrier. But the, ba uh, the bandpass filter filters off this right here such that all we get, all that gets transmitted out the antenna is the upper sideband. So the energy of the voice is sitting right in here modulated on top of the carrier frequency. So if you've got like 7, um, 7.040, uh, megahertz, seven megahertz, and you're just talking, and your voice, your voice is uh, what about 2.5 kilohertz, is a, a standard width of a single sideband signal. So this range right here is 7.0 up to uh, 72.5. No, uh, 500. So that's that's the uh, that there. My only point in doing this is that the signal coming in gets modulated to produce that s signal there, that sideband when you're talking. When you're doing CW, there are a couple of ways of producing it, but one straightforward way is that the uh, CW would key this little oscillator on and off. That's on-off keying. 
What had that happened, that audio oscillator, which is probably going to be set like to 800 hertz is, or 600 hertz is a very typical um, offset, CW offset. If you remember any of the, uh, some of the menus in your FT817 or your uh, MP1000 or whatever. So the, the keyer is, uh, or the paddle or the key is going to turn this audio oscillator on and off, which again is going to make this go, this signal right here, in this case here, it'll be 800 hertz above FC. Because we mixed it, took the, the sum, we threw away the difference, and the signal is going to go do 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 so it's going to pop up and down. Again, my point is, is that all it is in CW is um, generated a, a single frequency, sort of, uh, up, up there. Now to my point. Digital. You know, you might have thought that dig digital communications was really kind of esoteric and, and, and um, f tremendously complex equipment in order to, to generate it, but really not quite so. There's a little bit of, of uh, call it uh, um, mathematics magic in there, but the bottom line is that your digital communications, that's somebody sitting at a, at a laptop, and they're entering data, you're typing text, and the bottom line is that this computer is sending out ones and zero streams, streams of bits that are one or zero that represent your ASCII text that is being transmitted. These tones, uh, these ones and zeros, um, essentially are uh, input to, it's like a tone generator in a certain way, but that tone generator is what gets put into the balance mixer and again produces the same kind of, it's the same mechanism for producing the signal up here at 7.070, which happens to be a, uh, a popular digital watering hole where many uh, signals happen on 40 meters, digital signals. So this, the ones and zeros that are being typed here in the computer um, ultimately um, generate some tones, which sometimes happens in the actual software on the computer, and there's phase relationships, and there's mathematical equations that are performed in, in, a D, in the DSP sound card uh, in the PC, but bottom line is that the PC is generating those ones and zeros, which then form a couple of tones that are modulated or shifted by 90 degrees um, <coughs> and form the, mod, the basis for the digital, uh, for the, uh, the standard kind of A3J SSB signals that a standard transmitter, standard SSB transmitter puts out and that's where you, that same location is uh, on the output. Um, maybe it'll become a little bit clearer uh, downstream and uh, we can come back to it. But there, uh, the point I wanted to make is it's really not too much more than that. Oftentimes we leave the magic to the software program on the PC that does that and we don't have to worry about that. Sometimes it goes in an external device. Um, it doesn't even need a PC. I'll talk a little bit about this. I mentioned, I talked about this yesterday. You might have seen it in our demo room. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll come to this. But in here is that uh, the software algorithm that actually performs that, uh, uh, generates those audio tones, but using the same mechanism to put up uh, the, the spectrum up on your antenna. <clears throat> All right, so I sat down late one evening and uh, just started writing down the different modes that are around. You might recognize some of them. I didn't, and then I looked it up, to, to be honest. I looked it up, too, because I didn't, I knew there were more than I could remember, and uh, um, indeed there were. There's some, a lot of experimental ones. There's all sorts of different modes. Um, each one curiously has its own little standard uh, that's obviously if it's encoded into a computer uh, in some way it obviously needs to be uh, that received signal needs to be decoded so the standard exists oftentimes again it is either by a special group military perhaps or designed for certain uh, strengths again whether it's low power or entirely accurate oh, uh, bless you or um, entirely uh, conversational. So each one has its strength. Some are older, 
And some are, you know, I didn't even put CW on there, and I should have. <laughs> Doggone, here I was, we were, Dave and I were talking about it yesterday. Um, the uh, the digital, this, this is funny, the digital world, pe the people in the digital world call Riddy the oldest, uh, where is it, it's somewhere up there, call that the oldest uh, digital mode. And it, it, it could be, but again, CW is, is digital. You can't get any more digital than on and off. Um, so, but, but it, uh, it would uh, normally be grouped in here. And here's JT65 someplace. Did you see that there? You got JT... There's for six meters. Well, 65M. This is like one of those uh, word games, you know, with a, oh, here's a word here that you can go this way. And, and backwards, <laughs> backwards over there. And a, a whisper, whisper is there. So what we're gonna do, what I'd like to do is to take a handful of them. It would take me like all day to go through and, and talk about each one. But what I liked, I, I did is I selected a sample uh, of them. And um, again, an, uh, an audio sample with each. And just to kind of put it in perspective, when we're done going through, I don't know, maybe six or seven of these modes uh, and talking about its strength and popularity and whatnot, um, we'll get into what it's gonna take you to set up your station in order to do this. And believe me, it's, it's gonna be straightforward. In fact, uh, I don't wanna lead my hand too much, but I think it's, it's, it's just pretty important that, you know, sometimes we heard over in the other room uh, Oh, you got to make sure you've got uh, the biggest horsepower machine and the sound card's got to have like uh, 500 bits um, uh, and it's got to be able to have a very fast, you don't have to have the, the, the latest umpty um, uh system in order to do this. I do it on a smaller laptop that I have at home. I augment it with a, a wonderful little uh, external USB sound card and it was like 50 bucks from Amazon.com, uh, and uh, I, I'm able to do all of this stuff. I, within, and there's very little problems in setting up. It gets a little, a little bit on, you start pushing the envelope a little bit when you want to start talking uh, with, uh, to soft rocks, for example, and when you get into these SDR, software defined radio, which is a very close cousin to this whole digital mode setup. But the basics of operation is, is pretty straightforward, as we'll see. Uh, hang on to your question a second. You had one. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to try to derail you too much. Uh, looking at the modes, for instance, there's a PSK31 mm -hmm. and a PSK63. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Why is that? Well, I'm wondering if you're going to tie those in together. I mean, is, it, is the well, 63 just twice yeah. the speed rate of the 31, or is it more? To there's close derivatives of each other, and that's about what they are. Oftentimes, it's the bit. Um, uh, the bit rate that is being um, uh, talked about. So 63 typically would be 63, uh, uh, 63 baud or bits per second. Uh, PSK 31 is 31 bits per second. So it's a related to the bit, uh, bit rate. And it's something to keep in mind is what I mentioned earlier is that uh, it depended on the, on the, the application that you have uh, if you're if you're transmitting information to military overseas, you want to make darn sure that the information gets there, the transmission gets there, and that it's accurate. So in that case, you want to use something that is that is high power, and uh, probably as a result, a pretty wide bandwidth. QRPers, on the other hand, and that's where the genesis of uh, PSK31 sort of came about. Peter Martinez. Um, his, one, his one and only goal to this day, and it's interesting, people say, why don't you have your PSK-31 do this? He's the father of PSK-31. Why don't you have it do that? And he says, no, no, no. We must keep it 31 bits or 31 baud because the bandwidth, the narrow bandwidth was his absolute uh, requirement. The second requirement was uh, conversational mode on the keyboard. So he didn't want to be burdened with error correction. So each of the different derivatives that we see up there of a, of a basic, um, of a basic uh, mode uh, tend to differ a little bit in those regards. Some, you know, the basic mode might not have error correction. And, uh, the B mode uh, might uh, indeed have error correction. Uh, error correction. Um, 
PSK31 versus 63. 63 is a higher bit rate, which means it's a higher bandwidth, which means you need more power in order to achieve the same distance and, and communications integrity. Understand? Yeah. yeah I, okay. I just wondered if, if you were going to touch on uh, the basic differences other than the, the baud rate. I know PSK31 is technically, I think, 31.5 yeah. for a baud rate. So two times that is 63. That's, that's too close for coincidence. So. Yeah, exactly. No, no, you're absolutely right. I just, I'm, I'm filling in extra around your question, too, just to, because it's, it's kind of interesting to me at any rate. You had a question. Yeah, I was wondering if you could discuss what motivated you to get an external sound card, and mm -hmm. what are the, the specs you look for to make that decision? Oh, sure. We'll talk about, uh, the question is what motivated me to go the external USB sound card uh, route. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that um, in greater depth, but it, a quick summary is that I had a cheaper computer that didn't have stereo. Um, I do SDR, software defined radio a lot and you need stereo input for SDR. There's an I channel and a Q channel, quadrature audio signals, and they both have to be input at the same time. Many laptops do not have the stereo input capability. Further, some of the laptops, most of the laptops, do not have enough, it, it, the sound card is not good enough. It's good enough for our purposes of, you know, talking to mom and dad over the, uh, uh, or, or to the kids over the uh, uh, Skype, but it's not good enough to have good audio quality. You need more bits, you need to have a faster uh, A to D converter. But I'll talk about that, and I'll give you, I have a good link for that too. There was another question, I think. Yeah. Are there varying costs involved in, in each of these modes? So, yeah. Are there varying costs? Varying costs, yes. Is it more expensive, you know, the equipment and software and so on to get into one mode as opposed to? No. Not, generally, not, there's always going to be an exception, but um, but generally, the whole one of the beauties of this whole thing, and I think I had a title at one point. I'm not sure if it's still in there, but the the question was, um, does it cost more to get on the air with one digital mode as opposed to another? And uh, the beauty is that once you get your your system set up to input the audio from your rig. You're processing it in, in software, mostly. Well, 100%, you're processing it in software. And if you have a different mode, you use different software. The same setup for the physical, the physical link, as we say, of uh, the audio is coming into the, into the computer in the same manner every single time. So the answer is pretty assuredly is no, which is good. Except for Pactor? <laughs> like I said. Unless you're trying move then it becomes a uh... Right. But in the old days, in the older days, before computers were really prevalent and, you know, used here, there were dedicated uh, demodulation or what, what would they call them? Uh, T, TUs. So terminal units were dedicated hardware boxes that, that filtered at specific frequencies for mostly re, uh, RT, <coughs> RTTY, maybe others as well. Um, because the software was not either as, uh, the computers were not as uh, capable back then or they just weren't down and close to the user as they are today with the PCs and, and frankly they were more expensive. So better solutions, you know, pull out your 73 magazine oh, and, and QST from those, those later years or earlier years and you would see many audio amplifier circuits, uh, active filters, phase lock loops that would capture the frequencies being transmitted um, or needed for transmission um, by a, a given mode. Because again, the whole thing is to transmit a, mo a, transmit a frequency in a certain way. Um, what's, what's the frequencies for uh, RIDI? 170, it's one, there are two frequencies that 170 hertz apart, but what are the frequencies? 125. 21, 2125. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. And then plus 170. Okay, so um, those two frequencies would tend to be the, uh, what your audio filters, your active audio amps, audio amplifiers were tuned to such that when the signal, when the tone was present, the output would be a mark or a, um, a space. Much as what uh, Dave and I were speaking about yesterday for the CW, 
when a tone is coming in at 800 hertz, if that's what the Gertzel filter on the DSP, on the, on the PC program, or da -da -da -da, on this here, where uh, it was tuned to, we'd get a, an indication of a mark or a space. But anyways, today, mostly, it's, it's on the PC. Any questions? David. What, is there some statistic about the most popular digital mode? Yes. It's actually really, not PSK, what do you know about that? Um, it's generally, the, the question was, what is the most popular uh, digital mode? Um, I think uh, PSK31 is, the I think, the generally acknowledged most popular one. It's huge. It's huge. From an age length, RIDI has been around longer. There's probably many, many old timers that have been using that for years and continue to. Um, there's a big, by the way, there's a big RIDI contest. Do you know what the, the contest is coming up? It's in a weekend or two. So after this, when you all go home and you fly home and you, and you order your, your, uh, your Sound Blaster XI-5, I'll, I'll have the link up. Um, your sound card, and then you get the software, you get FL Digi in here, or DigiPan for just PSK31, but uh, FL Digi will do uh, ready. And there's a big contest, and you will be amazed. I mean, you've, you, I'm sure you've heard how the, uh, the contests go in the digital mode. It's like total, utter chaos. And you say, I gotta get off the air for the weekend, because there's no way that I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna let all these, these Digi nuts digital nuts go, you know, go back to sleep. But um, get your little station set up and just uh, tune around on, on the Aridi contest coming up. You will be amazed how you just kind of move over a little bit and boom, you get some guy calling CQ. And you do, you know, return to CQ with him and you get a serial number and move over. You'll spend all day doing that. And it's, it's a ball. Uh, but the point is, one of the points is, again, the beauty of digital mode is that you can get so many signals in a small bandwidth that it just, it's like shooting ducks in a pond. And it's just, uh, it's a lot of fun. <coughs> Is there commercial ready? Is there much commercial ready? Um, I, don't, I don't listen, I don't know. I don't listen outside the hand bands too much. Uh, does anybody know? Not really. Most of it's all changed over to uh, other modes. That's been, the, that's been the most corrupted mode now or uh, being able to be correct, okay. even NSA's changed over. Okay, so the answer, answer is not, uh, not much commercial ready uh, anymore. Uh, commercial has changed over to the more modern modes and probably adaptations of, the, of that to suit their own purposes. No more international telex. No more international telex. Uh, in the commercial world, I don't think you need to worry about let me do this the other way. I think you can be encrypted. You can, we, we, we cannot send obfuscated or encrypted messages here in the hand bands, but it's outside that, it, uh, so military and other commercial use that maybe they can modify the routines, the algorithms to, to suit their purpose. There's something in the I'm sorry? There's something, you know, not, not ham in the 30 meter band. Is there something non ham in the 30 meter band? Do you hear digital information, uh, digital transmissions? Um, maybe so. Could be. Could be. But the uh, PSK31 is, is, is the acknowledged, uh, it's, everybody says it's the undisputed uh, uh, king. Um, came about, again, uh, Peter Martinez back in 1991. Uh, 1999 um, was the uh, uh, the father of it, and he really, and actually before that, uh, I don't know if that some of you guys might remember. I don't know. There was a thing called BPSK um, by Phase Phase you know, Shifkin. There was a fellow in Canada, and um, he made uh, two little boards like this and he stacked them. And it was the very beginning, that's when I started and got into digital, because I, I built his boards. And it was, uh, it was sort of like when I first got onto the, onto the internet. And it, it, there was this thing called Chameleon, and a way to access the internet, and it was all very arcane and different. Now today, of course, that the standards have evolved, and who can even remember Netscape and Chameleon and, and all of that. And that was the same way back then with, uh, 
Bill somebody. Um, but he was so helpful in getting people on. But that, I think, was, you know, BPSK and PSK, are, they're both of the same family. Peter Martinez really defined the, uh, uh, the mode, uh, the standard. And again, his driving factor was that it was uh, conversational mode and it didn't have to go any faster than one could normally type and didn't care about error correction. Who cares if, uh, you know, you type uh, uh, instead of T-H-E, well, it's not even the right way to do it, but I mean, if, you're, if you mistype, all of us mistype, um, and you, so what, right? Um, oh, and by the way, this is kind of, this is an interesting thing here. On some of the scopes, on some of the, um, your, your, uh, your rigs, and certainly the band scopes, the spectrum displays on the programs that we'll show you, DigiPand, FL Digi, each of these mode has a characteristic, uh, Shape. This one happens to be bimodal in, that, in, in this way here. And you can see that each of these, well, you can't see it too well, but um, when the phase changes, the ultimate, <coughs> ultimately the, the, the spectrum energy changes slightly too, so that the separation between these is like on the order, well, um, I think each is, is plus and minus 15 hertz from the center point. So it's like a 31-ish hertz uh, bandwidth is where the, most of the energy is contained. The side lobe information or spectrum there is characteristic of, of how well or not how well you are modulating your, your, your transmitted signal. We'll talk a lot about that because there's so much emphasis given on well, guidance to, um, to, to people when they're doing digital modes to don't put the power up too much. We'll show some examples. In fact, this is a little bit, the samples here in the, uh, I don't know what these are taken from, whether it's FL Digi or what, but the, the spectrum display, this is what you would see on the typical program that you would load on your computer. And each one of these things, each one of these tracks, railroad tracks, if you will, is indeed a, uh, a transmission. So there's active uh, signals going on there. Um, let's, uh, let's click on a, a sample. And uh, we'll have some other examples that are a little bit more characteristic of what the, uh, did you, did the audio pick that up at all? Okay, good. So, um, it was a little bit more characteristic. It sounds like, uh, this is funny. If you've ever done a CW contest, you know, if you've ever done it like a, for a whole day or heaven forbid the entire weekend or like all, for 24 hours, you're taking a shower the next morning and you can swear that there's CW coming from that faucet in the shower, right? Your ears get so kind of in tune. With this, it sounds like crickets, at least to me. I've got crickets in my backyard, a little bit of like a, a wetland behind me. So in the springtime, there's little peepers. And in the late fall, they turn into the boom, boom, boom. But in the, in the springtime, it swears like there's a million, it swears like that I hear a million um, PSKers back there in my, in my uh, backyard. But you get, you get used to hearing this an awful lot, and you can really hear what's going on. But anyways, that's, uh, that's it. And then if you, um, very curiously, you could actually use the sound card. The quality's not that great, but if you have a nice, strong signal, you could use the, you know, the, the microphone that's built into many laptops, so you can do Skype and talk to you know, the kids and whatnot. You could hold a recording up of that and actually see the transmission come up on the screen. We'll, uh, we'll show that as, uh, as we proceed uh, through here. Darn. <laughs> Sorry, have to have to do what? You start talking to those crickets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I was so convinced one time. I took my laptop back in the in the woods, just to see, you know, because you know, who, maybe there was some relationship. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that didn't work. You thought I was kidding about the frog, didn't you? 
Okay, so here's Ritty. It's the oldest one around. Um, and I think, I don't know, it depends on when, where I got this information. It might still be the most popular contesting one. And believe me, again, if you just check, you know, check around to find out when this, this Ritty weekend is coming up, you'll, you'll really uh, know what I mean. Um, the frequencies are, tend to be standard here. So um, the watering holes, as I said, are kind of common. So if you want to hear a certain frequency, I've listed those that are common to given uh, bands. So go to there and just kind of hang out uh, at 7070, for example. Um, 707, did I mark that on the, on the PSK? 707, there you go. So you get to know uh, the frequencies that a given uh, mode is on. And you can, uh, you can go and, and check it out. It's a good indicator too, of course, if, there's, if the band is open. So if you have the typical, um, uh, dependent on your, your attitude of a digi trash coming in, you can, you can tell how, how good the band is uh, working that day. Um, it used to, the, this is, this is, I have, I have, uh, actually two, I have two of these in my basement, two of these guys here, and yeah, they do, and it's, it's awesome. I told you I'm into boat anchor, so I mean, anything that is old and I can get working, I, I just enjoy the heck out of it, but uh, I've got that, you know, you hear that, uh, it's a, mine is a Model 19, two Model 19s, and, um, uh, uh, the smell of the oil and the, oh, it's awesome. So, um, you never want to see it again? I know, I know, I can, I hear you. But anyway, that's what the old time, and that was totally mechanical. There was no electronics in there, and then it needed that, um, it needed that terminal unit, that audio filtering uh, technique in order to, and then the, the audio, the audio tones turn to mark and space at very specific frequencies, specifically 45 baud, 45 bits per second, would be sent to that ter uh, to sent to the hardware, and it would print out actual print out. And whatever you type on that uh, on that RIDI equipment, it would generate the marks, the just contact closures, marks and spaces at that at particular rate, which would then go into that that audio uh, that uh, electronics box. And generate the tones, you know, 2125 and <coughs> whatever the other one was. Have you actually got the linker subsets? The linker yeah. subs? The what? Linker. Linker subsets. I don't know what that is. Oh, I'm sorry. Linker subsets? Linker. Linker. L-E-N-K-H. Linkert. I don't know what that is. All right. This is the old electronic bar that we used to use to the I actually can make the tones. Make it receive. Oh, okay. I use a TU. I built a ripped. I ripped. I built a copy of uh, uh, ST5. It's a common one, I thought. ST6. Yeah, maybe. Was in, uh, CQ mag HR magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Navy Mars guy for uh, big and sort of that. Here's the. I, I need to move, move along a little more quickly. Sorry. You can, you can actually hear the two tones a lot better there because the separation is tremendously more, you know, 170 hertz separation versus the what, 15 hertz, or yeah, the 15 hertz plus minus that PSK31 offers. So that's why the closer they are, it sounds more like a cricket as opposed to two tones that are going back and forth. Again, very common sound on the, uh, on the air. All right, now Pactor, somebody knows Pactor. I don't use, I know it too well, um, but, uh, this is also, it's, it's kind of an older one. Um, it's error-free, which is, is one of the, uh, um, one of its characteristics. So it's got uh, error correction, a wider bandwidth, as it says there, probably two times the uh, bandwidth of what's, the frog, <laughs> there's my frog. So you hear that, that pulsing, that uh, burst. And uh, it, a lot of it is used for mailboxes. Um, you probably have heard of, uh, I think I'll talk about Packet here also. So Packet was used for uh, sending emails over HF and, and VHF as well. 
Uh, and this is a mode that used to send information posted into bulletin board or BBSs. And as it says here, because of that error correction, on one of the trade-offs to get error correction, it takes a long time to send a message, and especially if, 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 you, if the path is imperfect or a noisy QRM type of uh, band, QRM or QRN. Why? Because if there is an error detected in the transmission, it transmits it again. So it's a bit of that hand uh, that uh, it's, it's, it takes longer to recover a, a, a full um, accurate signal. Question. Yeah. Yeah, is, is there any software only way to do backdoor? Do you have to have a hardware device? No, I think, I think we, there, is, there was hardware solutions back earlier, right? One and two, I understand, are open source. Three, three is uh, you have to buy a motor from SPS. So in other words, the question was, was there hardware required, or either now or later, or earlier, was there hardware required for Pactor? Probably, of course. You have to have hardware for Pactor 3 because it's a proprietary standard. Yep. And you can only buy that hardware from a company that I think it's SGS. SCS. SCS? I mean, okay. So Pactor 3 is the one that has proprietary in implementation and hence would need a, a hardware solution. And it happens to be proprietary from SCS. SCS, yeah. But the, the, the uh, WinLink 2000 folks have come up with something called WinMore, which mm -hmm. is open source, and they found a good presentation at DCC last year, and they're, they're getting comfortable that it would actually serve as a replacement for Pactor 3. And the price is right. Okay. So it'll be side by side. Pactor so WinMore, uh, again, more. I'll repeat these things for the audio, but. Winmore is a, um, a solution for Pactor 3, did you say? Yeah, but again, so it's you're paying for the, the perfect copy is, is yeah. bottom line if you want to do that implementation. Um, it's meant for sailors and RVs, you know, and they'll pay it. The, uh, my understanding is the CSS, you know, Pactor 4, but I don't know. Check out this tone. I, I really like this. It makes sense. How many tones do you hear there? You cheap. Now, Dave and I can probably relate to this. How many Gertzel filters are, do we have running at the same time? As a result, probably it, any kind of a of a computer program that is filtering on these tones. And again, it all comes back on the receive side. On the transmit side, it's simple. And whatever the algorithm is to generate a tone, your computer program is generating a tone at this. If, you're, uh, if we're talking spectrum-wise, here's a tone, here's a tone, here's a tone. Each of these is a different frequency. So whether it's a 16 or 32 um, or 8, uh, there would be that many different signals kind of occurring at different times. So it's kind of like um, there's a lot of combinations. If you work up the mathematics of that, a lot of bit combinations. And again, I'm not sure if this one has error correction or not, but it's really good for poor uh, signal conditions. If you're at all into um, spread spectrum uh, communications, one of the benefits there, one of the benefits is that if the if the signal that you're working on, if the frequency that you're working on is kind of has noise or interference or jamming, there are, it's, it's spread spectrum, there's a, a, a semi-random generation of what frequency you would go to beyond that, but you're always hopping around in that area. This is, in a, is a similar way in that it's transmitted on multiple frequencies, so the band, uh, the, the algorithm is able to actually use that multiple or semi, sometimes redundancy in order to recover and uh, perform well in low signal conditions. Low signal conditions is when your signal is low to the noise floor. There might be a lot of noise that's messing up a certain tone, but other tones are getting through. <clears throat> and as it says, tuning is really critical for that, because if, you, if you're transmitting on these frequencies, you want to, and you, your receiver, and your receiver is it's got to be kind of lined up on all of the frequencies, and they have to be well calibrated to each other to, and not have different 
spreads, if you will. Can, uh, George, can you comment on the, the power levels? What, yeah. What, 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 where I'm trying to go with this thing is uh, the, uh, your, your last one, uh, the one with the 16 columns here, and that's NFSK 16. Mm -hmm. Is it going to take a look at that? Yes. Uh, yeah, generally, so technically, it's going to take more power to transmit the same distance. That's the key, and that's the key. So the question was, you know, what's the relationship of the power versus the bandwidth is really what it comes down to. If you have a higher, uh, a wider bandwidth, such as we have here, the, the same, if you have the same amount of power going into generating signals in, the, in a wider bandwidth, generally uh, it's not going to go as far. If you want the same kind of copy at the end between the two stations transmitting and receiving, you would have to put more power into um, a, a, a scheme that has a wider bandwidth. Now, there are techniques to kind of counter that. There's all sorts of techniques. For example, um, each of those different frequencies are very specifically set here, the, the, either the 8 or 16. So you could envision having little signal generators and very narrow signal detectors on the receive side at each of those. So cumulatively, they might be operating over a wide spread, but each one is a narrow bandwidth to its own tone. Did I? Yeah, well, actually, I was going to hit the second part of this one. Uh, because, we, because we need more bandwidth for this particular one, but uh, you have more bandwidth capability and probably implement forward error correction or something similar, uh, is, is NF SK-16 have a better transmission rate for a given distance than, say, MFSK-8? Uh, I see what you mean. And I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I'd have to look it up and, um, myself. So um, the question was, you know, does, for a given power level, does MFA, MF SK-8 versus 16, which is the better for a given uh, distance and power level? I'm not sure. So I think, you know, there are studies and comparisons that you could probably easily check that out. And that kind of brings me to the point. I want to, um, let me go all the way to the end if I can. But right here is some useful references. I mean, there could, this could be pages and pages, and you can find something similar in, uh, you know, just do a, a, a Google search on digital modem ham, just to kind of narrow the field, or digital, digital modes ham would really resolve that uh, for you. But right, uh, um, right here, this website, if you search on G4UCJ, I unabashedly uh, grabbed a lot of information from his website, and he has more information that I could even possibly fit in here, uh, sound samples included, um, and, and hence I credit him, though. But my point is, is that this is a great website that can um, yield you some really good information. So you check that out for sure. Um, my address is at the end, but the simple one, if you just want to contact me, is n2apb at verizon.net. So if you've got a question that comes up along the way, you feel like you, I might be able to help you in some regard, feel free to write me, uh, no problem at all. n2apb at verizon.net. Hellschreiber is, uh, so, so here's the one that they call is the oldest one. Okay, so my, my apologies on that. It's not Riddy, yeah, but it's, uh, it's Hellschreiber. A uh, really interesting thing about this one is that it's actually transmitting a bitmap, what I call a bitmap, but it's a, the, it's a picture. So they're just taking, I don't know how they generate it, to tell you the truth, but they generate uh, the signal as a, uh, as a, what's called a ticker tape display. Now this is the ticker tape, I think, that's this. The, here's here's a ticker tape right here. So this would be the first line that be be displayed. You go, and then the next one come down here, and you see some obvious overlap. So it's almost like the source material that was scanned in lines widths of that much, right? And there's no attempt to make it uh, error correcting, correlate a character, and re reproduce a character. Um, on a screen that was ultimately sent from the transmitter, just transmit the image and let your 
your brain, your eyes do the correlation. Now anybody can fairly easily see this is uh, call your, uh, probably thanks for the call, your RST579579 QSB name, blah, blah, blah and, and so on. So your eye can, extra, uh, can extrapolate uh, and, and, and interpolate and extrapolate the information. The best analogy is imagine an old style dot matrix print of one dot sweeping across. You all do that. Or, or, even though today's modern printers, I mean, you lose a, an ink cartridge and you sort of like, you know, I, I, I'm missing the blue ink, but I can figure out what that is. Dots, yeah, same thing. One dot at a time, but all the way across. And yeah. Now you'll get a kick out of the sound. Maybe not. So it's like grading. It's, it's a grading, as I said up there. Like a what? Um, yeah. Well, it kind of makes sense. The comment was that it sort of sounds like a fax machine. The older, when you actually are hearing those tones. Yeah. The bandwidth requirement must be counted astronomically compared to the data being transferred. Well, let's. Uh, I don't know the bandwidth for this. Um, it's hard. We don't know the uh, resolution on this scope signal, on this uh, spectrum signal. So. This one tone on with the intensity I'm sorry, what? Is it just sending one tone that the amplitude varies in intensity, or is it frequency shift key between you know, light and dark? I don't know. It's obviously a, there's a grayscale. There's a grayscale in, in thresholding, so I don't know. Yeah, I would probably guess that every character is a seven by eight matrix, so I need seven times eight bits. Well, not so, not so. It's not a character with a, with a matrix uh, dimensions, because it's, this, is, this is the resolution. I mean, this might even be one. It's a line scan. This, is, this, this right here, what I'm outlining, is probably the width and uh, of the uh, the resolution of that particular scan, and it could be a picture of your frog, and then and it would transmit across. This just happens to be a picture of some text. I don't know. I'm I'm just not familiar with it enough to know, you know, the mechanics of how the scan was generated. But when they say go to hell, this is what they're really talking about. <laughs> I don't say it here, do I? I used to have it, but I think I cleaned up. What? The uh, bandwidth on six, about 62 and a half hertz is the specification. Did you look it up? And uh, it's, in practicality, it's a little bit wider than that. I think it's 62 hertz? 62 hertz. <coughs> oh, and a half. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> OK, very measurable. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. 62 and a half is not bad. That's like PSK 63. Well, 63 and a half. Yeah. Or it's 62 and a half. I'm a little curious about, about that particular mode. There's a big company in Germany that makes drum scanners. The name of the company is actually Dell. Oh, I know. It's a pre-press industry. I come from that a long time ago. Is that the I don't believe so. I'm pretty sure that's where it's going to You think it is? The question is, where did the name, what, what was the derivation of the name, given that we know that there's a German company named Hell, um, uh, that it, it, was a, it was a company that does drum scanning, real high resolution image scanning. You wrap the image around a drum, and there's a line scan that is processed, precessed along, or processed along the, uh, the drum. Maybe so. Does anybody understand German? Schreiber is? Writer, 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 writer. There you go. And actually, I think the Hell is not a scanner. It's a writer. It's, a, it's an image writer, the, the Hell product okay. from Germany. So that could well be. I'll be darned. I thought they were originally used for uh, newspapers. Yeah. Yes. OK, we'll do a couple more of these, then we'll drop down to some. We'll, we'll skip the rest. You'll be able to see it in the slides and the samples and so on. Um, let me just see. Let me 
in fact, let me just let me just do this, okay? Because I think it's kind of cool. Let's listen to the packet. <laughs> now, as it says here, there's addressing on these packets, which are typically used for a bulletin board and email and uh, types of postings. Here is the address of where that information is destined, sort of like, a, uh, like an IP address of, of the earlier days. And this is the information content. You could really become the hit of the house if you turn, if you turn this on in your rig and you let it go all day long. On. <laughs> This is cool. The Olivia is cool. It's uh, pretty new. Um, it's very, it's a wide, it's a pretty wide uh, bandwidth, and um, it uses a lot of the, the tones I was talking, the multiple tones. You've heard that before, I think. But it's a. Now I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't profess to be an expert on, on all of these and, and many of them, but the bottom line is that there are multiple tones that are used in the, al in the algorithm for generating, representing the information that's being transmitted and hence a synchronizing on the receive side to, to get those tones. And whether it's a time-based, um, a time-based, uh, what would you call it, Dave, a time modulation? time-based like CW, on or off at that given frequency, or whether within each of those different frequencies, uh, whether there is further modulation and phase shifting and, and so on. I don't know, I just don't know. But the point is, is that you can, there are very clever ways that people, you know, much smarter than, than me, have been able to be generating and, and recovering information. And that's why we have such a proliferation of these. Automatic link, uh, establishment is kind of a, an interesting one. It's used, so it's used for um, obviously. In fact, you might have heard a little bit about this, uh, or implied a uh, get what Bob Berninga was uh, working with. It starts getting into you know uh, using transmitted information, and for some reason I couldn't find um, the spectrum display on this one, but used for. <laughs> Connecting two stations. All right, JT65 is the one I wanted to touch on. There's a lot of good information on this. And of course, Joe Taylor is just absolutely <coughs> an amazing guy. And, and again, the bottom line is that it's a derivative of his basic al algorithm and started with the whisper and um, WSPR, weak signal propagation. Actually, what? it started with JT65, then he went to whisper. Is that right? Yes. OK, good. I was hoping somebody would know more. The JP65 is actually developed for moon baths. OK. As most of the, everybody knows, you want a Nobel <coughs> Prize for uh, listening for hours down there at SIBO. And he wanted to come up with a better way of doing uh, transmission off the moon. It was up until that time, all we did was CW. You listen for the CW sound inside the, mm -hmm. the noise. <clears throat> Joe came up with JT65, and uh, to a lot of people, the Europeans are still arguing CW is the only way. The Americans are all like, hey, JT65 is great. Uh, myself, I work off the moon, uh, two meters, JT65B. I've got 80 countries confirmed. All right, Joe just received his DXCC <laughs> number 70. <laughs> two meters, all right, just to let you know where the number in chart is. <coughs> the latest one, so it's 70, I think somebody else just applied for theirs. That's amazing. And 65 is what's opened the door for all of us to bracket, the, uh, bracket up. I've been doing it for about 15 years. Okay, how long does it, first of all, Cliff, are you getting any of that audio? Good. Okay, thank you very much for the offering that. Um, how long does it take to do a, a typical <coughs> Confirmation QSO, just a quick, you know, five five nine or uh, two two two. Uh, done in one minute transmissions. I'm sorry, I missed it. 
Everything is being done in a one minute transmission. Right. All right, so you receive for a minute, you transfer for a minute. You're either on the odd time or the even time. So you got a minute to transmit. You got one minute to transmit, then you listen for one minute. During that one minute, <clears throat> you're actually running from the beginning of your time for about 50 seconds. At 50 seconds, it cuts off. From 50 seconds until the one minute time, it decodes the information that it's just picked up. That information, once it's picked up, is then written out on the screen. So most guys would send their, your call, you know, the original part would be, uh, your call, my call, your call, my call, your call, my call, your call for 50 seconds. Then if you hear it, then you say, yeah, I, I, got a, I got his call and his grid and that. I'll turn around and I'll send O's. So I'll send his call, my call, his call, my call. Okay. Call okay, I got it. And it's all done in one in one minute sequences. It sounds interesting. It sounds like a long a long effort, but it's uh, for the effort. You know, you're it's a low. Uh, it, it's high. Uh, you're really able to dig the signals out of the uh, of the ground. Depending on how big the station and how big the antenna system is, okay. you actually hear it in the speaker. Other times, you never hear it. You just see it printed out on the screen. There you go. So there's a lot of information on this, and obviously being the, probably one of the more popular new ones, um, the, we have some specialty, you know, some specialists, some guys are starting to concentrate a lot in that. And there's a lot of information on the internet, so you can check that out for sure. I'm sure just check out, search on JT65 and, and, and Whisper in general. Uh, we have somebody, just FYI, we have somebody that's uh, working on putting Whisper beacon capability into the SDR cube, <coughs> into the SDR cube transmitter, uh, transceiver. So um, I'm hoping that I can take that and extend it to, uh, to be JT65, actual transmission capabilities. Obviously frequency sta uh, synchronization and stable time synchronization is important as, as you were saying. We all have, we all use a uh, AP timer. Okay, because you know, it's very important that we transmit at the beginning and at the end yep. the transmission. So we're all timed in there. You have to listen very carefully here. This is, I think, is this characteristic of what you would be hearing or do you not even hear? This is a, we get more, we get something similar to that when we would be receiving it on that two years. We would hear something similar to it. Okay, let me move along. We're gonna be coming up. We have 15 minutes left. Okay, so there's, there's a smattering of, oh, how about that? There's a smattering overview. Let's get into actually how you would construct a very simple, straightforward uh, uh, HF digital station. As I sort of indicate there, uh, here, all you really need is a laptop of some sort I mean, maybe better than a 1990 vin vintage laptop would, uh, would be good. Here's a picture of the, the sound card. The, uh, um, the details will be shortly, but it's uh, Sound Blaster uh, XI something. And an SSB transceiver. Why can't you use a, uh, uh, a CW transmitter, a transceiver? You know, a lot of QRP. Uh, rigs are CW only, and you just can't you can't use that. Uh, it's it's not a linear, and it's not able to transmit varying levels of, of voice energy, and so on. Um, so it's got to be an SSB transceiver. For most people, most of us here, obviously any of the commercial gear that you have is uh, going to be uh, SSB. And the comment uh, right here is we mentioned this before. Once you have this setup. That's it. That's all you need uh, for nearly everything that, that we're talking about. Okay, the computer. Um, there are recommendations, and uh, it turns out that XP or greater is going to be most helpful. Um, I've had just a lot of luck in general, thankfully, <coughs> with uh, Windows 7. So if you haven't upgraded from Windows 7, I've been a hold off on XP for ages, and I just had to get a new computer, and I couldn't. I didn't want to 
uninstall Windows 7. I gave it a try, and I'm really liking it. And so there's growing support for it, and it's much more stable. And security is, I'm a security guy, cybersecurity guy, so the security is infinitely better than XP. With, uh, Vista you can throw away, um, as most people indeed have. You can use Macs, just use one of the more modern Macs. They have uh, better drivers and response times in, in the uh, low-level hardware. Um, the bigger they, as, as with things in general in life, the bigger the better. Um, this recommendation says don't rely on the built-in sound card. It doesn't hurt to try it, you know, what the heck. Just keep in mind that the built-in sound card is mono. Now that'll mono, mo monophonic uh, as opposed to stereo. Uh, mono will work um, on everything that we've talked about here just fine, so that's not a big problem. But when, you get, when we get to the sound card right here, um, I'm going to indeed, and there's the uh, address. Um, it's it's hard. Just search. Just go to Amazon and search on um, Creative Blaster and look for the XFi XFi surround. Um, go for stereo. Definitely go for stereo. Why? Because chances are, someday, sometime, once you get the hang of of the digital modes, you're going to want to <coughs> give SDR a try. This isn't an SDR talk, but I got to plug it anyways. Um, if you really want to give a get into SDR and you haven't uh, heard about the soft rocks yet, for like fifty-five dollars, you can get a, a kit. Um, it's called a soft rock ensemble. Is the latest uh, current one. If you're lucky to get it on the website fast enough, um, but uh, get the ensemble, and it's a three-band transceiver that all it is, what we call the RF front end. So you connect it, you have to build it, you power it with 12 volts, you supply uh, an antenna to it, and uh, most of them these days are gonna have a USB cable, so you don't even need necessarily one of these. You can go into the USB port on your computer. And, um, but I won't even get into the hassles that you have with getting the right USB drivers and the right versions and uh, it's, 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 it's ugly. Uh, the soft rock is the software. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the ensemble, not so, not so. The, the, huh? Yeah, you got to have a cable that goes over the sound. You're using the sound card. I mean, it's not just USB. You got to have the sound card. You got to have the sound card in the in the in the laptop. We'll talk offline. Um, at least the one I'm referring to, it, it definitely does not have a codec. Uh, it does not have a codec on it. Yeah, we're. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, we're talking pretty much the same. Yes, yes. Okay, I understand what you're saying. The question that we were debating: you need uh, the soft rock, the specific version of the soft rock that we're talking about, the ensemble, uh, needed to use the USB only for power, actually, and controlling the frequency. Um, so control the LO. Remember that. Hello, that I was talking about, and then the two audio channels, the I and the Q coming out, would go into either the laptop or into um, another device that served as the sound card. Thank you. Um, so again, this is the heart of it. This is like 55 bucks from Amazon.com, and I use it for also. I've got an old turntable. I'm into old time bluegrass, and I like to record L uh, uh, vinyl transfer vinyl to audio, and I use this for that. So, I mean, it's like 9,600, it's 9, or 96 kilohertz. So it's good enough for me. I can't hear it well to begin with, so it, uh, um, it, it certainly works. Now, there are other uh, devices on the market that, that are, are pretty nice, and these, indeed, have some of the sound cards built into them. So uh, this, uh, these are kind of cool, and they're, they're nice because they also interface, they, they isolate the, uh, the radio, your, your RF radio from the computer. Um, if any of you were over at my booth over there, um, when the SDR cube is connected to um, our modem, there would be a lot of digital hash that was heard. Um, and sometimes you get hum, and sometimes you get uh, different voltage potentials between the two devices, especially if they're powered from two separate sources. So it's nice to opto-isolate. It's nice to uh, electrically isolate 
uh, the, the audio path and keep them nice and separate. So what we've got is... As a problem sitting next to my transmitter, it'll, it'll pick up if I'm on it. RF energy. It'll drive the mouse around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very disconcerting. Like uh, huge RF chokes can be your friend. Those interfaces can be used instead of the sound part? Is that how it works? In some cases, yeah. On other cases, I'm not sure exactly which items are shown there. Some of them just provide an isolation for the PTT signal. Here's a representation of, of a sound card. Uh, um, it, it's relatively straightforward as far as taking your, the receive audio into the sound card itself um, and having a sound card interface that, that uh, provides that isolation we're talking about and also isolation for the uh, keying or the, the PTT. Or it turns out you can make it yourself. I mean, I see it. So um, uh, it's pretty easy to make these. This is not opto-isolated at all, but nonetheless it interfaces uh, pretty easily on most rigs. Software. There's a lot of different software programs out there that can actually decode and generate. FL Digi is by far the most popular. Um, um, this is a pretty busy screen. Uh, bottom line is that if we have time afterwards, maybe off in a, in a lobby, we can actually show some signals coming in and uh, being decoded. The, the tones coming in, the, the QSO, if you will, of course, the text is right here, and all sorts of uh, logging and different kinds of time stamping. There's a lot of capabilities along, um, along this particular uh, uh, the menu bar. So just it's free. Search out FL Digi. You'll download it from a certain, uh, any number of uh, uh, servers. Another one that I just love. I just, I, first of all, I love Skip Teller, KH6TY. He and his buddy Nick uh, generated DigiPan a while ago, and I, it's, you know, PSK31 is the most popular, it's the most uh, prolific, and, and I love this program. I use this for testing all of the new PSK modems. Um, and I just, it's just a very intuitive type of program. It's free, download, it's always updated to the latest. And again, you see a nice, as with FL Digi, you see a nice, a nice waterfall uh, display of the different signals. We didn't talk much about it, but the bottom line is that you have to make sure you don't overdrive the transmitter. Because when you do that, you get a lot of splash and splatter and a, one large, uh, <clears throat> one very uh, overpowered signal might produce all sorts of sidebands down, up and down the band, and you become very unpopular very quickly on the bands. And sort of wrapping it up here, you don't need a PC. Again, as, as my buddy Alfonso Bedoya in 1948 said, you don't, badges, badges, we don't need no stinking badges. All of this stuff with the PC is very cool. There's a lot of power in the PC, there's no doubt about it. But I don't like taking my PC to the field um, uh, overnight in a damp tent up on top of a mountaintop, maybe dropping it, hard to see in the sunlight. I'm not going to take this, this mama that I've got here. There's no way I'm going to take that anywhere in an uncontrolled way. So the processor, the embedded processor in here, admittedly, doesn't have all the bells and whistles of FL Digi. There's, there's a lot of power in those. Or SDR. Uh, uh, power SDR when it comes to um, doing SDR stuff. But there's nothing better than taking this plus your FT817, your SDR cube, and you got it. You can do digital modes. And we're always adding uh, new capabilities to the software. You can easily update it. You, you get this thing once. You just continue downloading the new modes, the new software algorithms that we provide on the website. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, straightforward and simple. I like simple. And uh, that's, I don't have to deal with the drivers and the version number of the operating system and the reboots and, and dings and boops coming in that get transmitted over the air because my mail, you have mail, you know, that kind of stuff. There's, be careful about audio levels. I mentioned don't overdrive. There's a technique that says use your ALC to make sure that you don't uh, overdrive. And so there's an example of some of the splatter. It can be pretty bad. All right, so what's stopping you? Get your, get your sound card, get your laptop, annoy your wife and kids with all that noise, start hearing crickets in the backyard, look for that frog in your pocket, and have yourself a good time. 
All right. Any, uh, can, I, can I answer any questions in the moments that we have remaining? Happy, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Again, my address, email address is n2apb at verizon.net. Um, I'm, I'm always on, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, uh, if you have them. And you know, give you a hand or a pointer on, is this sound card good, or what's wrong with that program, or what's an advantage of MT63? I'll find out the answer for you if I wasn't able to do it here today. Okay, thanks a lot, guys.